I told you that by 2020, we'll be spending $400 billion a year building smart cities? Never mind the next up-and-coming borough in our own cities, it's now about which one will be smart cityed up first. What if traffic congestion was monitored by embedded sensors and change lights accordingly? Or if a hybrid bicycle wheel could monitor pollution, traffic and road conditions in real time? Or, and this might be slightly creepy to some, if street lights turned on as you walked by and then turned off to save electricity afterwards? The Internet of Things is a major tool that allows us to connect these infrastructures to the environment in which we live. This is also about sustainable and alternative energy sources and digital services and gadgets that will allow policymakers and city councils to track the true health of their city. So let's grill two pros for their take on what you, the consumer, can expect from the smart city of the future. Jonathan Mikhail, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Brilliant. So listen, I'd love to start by getting each of you to paint a picture for us very quickly of a really creative example of a smart city advance that's on your radar. Mikhail. Well, I think one thing we need to remember is that a lot of smart city solutions are actually quite simple and solve a problem for the city and for the citizens. So we don't really think of a smart card for transportation, for example, as a smart solution, but that's a, a really interesting solution that in other cities has, has been moved far beyond just use for tubes and buses and etc. And in Copenhagen, for example, they are using one smart card for all public transportation, including a car share scheme. And I think that's really interesting. That could be very handy, Jonathan. Yeah, absolutely. High tech consumer um, solutions, which are great. Um, another example, the F1 cars and the technology within F1 cars have been recently taken to rail stations around the world and using that regenerative braking system to actually feed power back into the tube stations alone. It's going to cut costs across the board, so that's, that's really exciting tech. So there's not even impact for just the consumer, but there's actually potential social impact for the community as well, which is what's fantastic about these projects. So Jonathan, specifically for you, now PaveGen is very well known as an early pioneer in the smart city space with your energy generating pavement installations. What made you guys look at the floor, the pavement, and think of optimizing it in this way? It's very, very clever. As we know, populations are rising. Um, for London specifically, the total population is rising by over a train carriage every three days and the global population, over 75% of the global population, will be living in cities by 2050. So these are scary facts. Um, unfortunately, I was not there on day one of the PageN technology. Um, however, the story goes that our CEO, Lawrence Kemble Cook, he was walking through King's Cross Station very magically and looked at all of the potential power from people walking through that space and thought, you know, what if your walk to work in the morning could power the lights on your walk home? In, in the evening. So, very romantic. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. It's converting footfall, which you sort of take for granted, isn't it, into something that could be a source of sustainable energy. And very tangible as well. Yes. And that's important yes. for people to understand. Exactly. Now, Mikkel, I know that you have your finger very closely on the pulse of smart city startups. Is the current commercial appetite, however, let's say from businesses or city councils or mayors, in line with the tremendous social impact value that, let's say, the three of us are very aware of? Well, that's a really good question because everyone can see the implications and the benefits of smart cities, but there's still quite a few barriers to take up. And, um, you know, lots of different parties have to play a role in rolling out uh, citywide solutions. There's a lot of integration and a lot of uh, cooperation that's required. And the business models and the business cases for those solutions need to be really well understood before the investment is deployed. I can imagine. So by 2030, Malmo in Sweden aims to run off solely renewable energy. That's quite ambitious. What would you like to see achieved closer to home in 10 years' time, Jonathan? Well, I'm obviously going to be very biased on this one. Um, you know, a, a people-powered city, but it's all about having a, a mix of renewable energy solutions and not only that, technology solutions that can help optimise and, and make our cities more efficient. 
Yeah, I agree. I'd like to see a lot more clean energy and, uh, and clean tech solutions. I can see that the convergence between the digital economy and the resource sectors is starting mm. to create a whole new ecosystem of solutions uh, and services that will create a better quality of life in cities and, and create healthier environments. Yeah. Now, Jonathan, New York City are currently working on a project on the East River to create a self-filtering pool that filters out sewage. And India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, has promised to build, and I kid you not, a hundred smart cities. That sounds very challenging, but it might just be doable. Realistically, what are some of the very specific roadblocks, and feel free to speak from personal experience, from PaveGen, do smart cities encounter from concept and ideation to actually deploying it to market and seeing their project piloted in the city? You've got financial constraints for new technology coming through and then you've obviously got the adoption side. And I think we've seen the landscape changing a huge amount from the adoption side and the people that can help the adoption happen, which are those early adopters who have the finance. And I guess how that links in, it's, it's, it's tangible and physical case studies of technology. I do really like the Plus Pool project in, in New York. And what's so amazing about that is that it's brought the communities together um, to, to own specific tiles in the pool. And, and crowdfunding and crowdsourcing all of these campaigns is now becoming very hot and, and creating some, some good drive. Yeah, and hopefully all of this gives it the momentum that it actually deserves. Guys, listen, thank you for being here on Digital Futures today. It's been a really fun dialogue. Thank you. It's been nice to be here. It was great. Thanks for having us. By 2050, 70% of the world's population will live in urban spaces. Now, it's our hope that we'll see the demand for more sustainable city projects continue to shoot up. Some say that smart cities is a buzzword and that in years to come, we'll see that our cities are in fact not that different. What do you think? More than a buzzword? I certainly think so. Thank you for watching.